welcome everybody. We've got a big crowd tonight. So if you want to stand with us and sing, you're welcome to. We're starting Big Green Jesus.
Good evening, everyone. So happy as Peggy said, large crowd tonight. Sarcasm. But we're glad, we're glad that those that did come out tonight did. And those that can't, we'll pray for them that they'll uh, be able to come back at the next point in time. Uh, one thing that uh, the Lord has asked me to do is about your tithes. Don't forget any tithes. You can take those up on the way out. But our online giving, there's several ways that you can do that. You can go to our website and click the giving button. And you go in there and there's multiple ways that you can give online. And you can actually even pick the account that you want to give in. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me and I'll be happy to walk you through that. Um, you can also text. There's a way of texting that you can actually text through your phone to give. And, you know, like she said this morning, we, we've had a good response on the giving online. Um, during this um, health crisis that we were supposedly under. Um, so we want to make sure that we continue our tithing online. We appreciate those that did give online and those that can give here at church. Um, like I said, any questions, feel free to give me a call and I'll be happy to walk you through it. Um, Pastor Keith had asked me, I think it was maybe last Sunday, I'd call him, talk to him, and he asked me if I'd do a message and I said sure and I asked him what day and time and he said I don't know yet I said okay so I got ready so I'm sorry that you people that are here has got to deal with my 15 pages of notes <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding it's not that long but it's pretty no, hopefully it won't be that long tonight <clears throat> excuse me what I titled tonight was on beauty what is beauty what we as Christians think is beautiful. You know, and I, and I think maybe the reason this enticed me is when you're sitting at the ocean, I was at the beach last week, and I'm sitting down there, and you just look. We're in a beautiful place, too. We live in a beautiful place in the mountains of North Carolina. But you know, when you go somewhere different, you see that beauty. It's different. So it's, it's, it's how you look at it. God's beauty and I'm not talking about the beauty of a person tonight. I'm not talking about the beauty on the outside. Like we would have if we were uh, going into some type of relationship with someone. I want to talk about the beauty of the relationship you have with Christ. Because that relationship you have with Christ is completely different than the beauty that we show physically. I'm going to look at the spiritual sense of beauty. So the beauty to a Christian shouldn't be the sin that we see in people either. It shouldn't be the sin, their actions, the life they're living, whether it's a male or a female or even the color of their skin. When we look at people, what do we see? So you can see I'm going at this in multiple ways. The beauty that Christ gives and the beauty we're supposed to show and the beauty we're supposed to see in people. Because if God hadn't seen the beauty in us, where would we be tonight? So... We have to be careful when we look at people, the actions that we give, what is the beauty of what we're seeing. So I'm going to go to Ecclesiastes, and I'm just going to read the verse in 2.26, and it says, and I'm not going to, I just want to read it. It's kind of, this is kind of like a, you ever watch one of them shows where they show you a clip, and it's actually the ending, but it's at the beginning, and you have to watch the whole show to figure out what the ending was why we got to that point. That's what I'm doing here. So it says, For the person who pleases Him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, He gives the working of gathering and collecting, so that He may give to one who pleases God. This too is vanity and chasing after the wind. Now, like I said, I'm not going to go into that right now. We're going to... Um, we're going to go straight into Ephesians. And what I'm reading out is the Amplified. And what's up there is the King James Version. So if you go to the Amplified, if you've got it, you can follow along. Of course, the uh, King James is it's a little different version. So if we go to Ephesians 2, 1 and 2, it says, And you He made alive when you were spiritually dead 
and separated from Him because of your transgressions and sins, in which you once walked, you were following the ways of this world, influenced by this present age, in accordance with the Prince of Power of our Satan. The Spirit who is now at work in disobedient, the unbelieving who fight against the purposes of God. Is that not what we're seeing today? Amen. Are we not seeing this complete people against what the Spirit of God has? We were once there. If you're a Christian tonight, which I probably believe everybody in this in here tonight is a Christian, from the from the fruit that you bear and show me when we come to church, everyone here is a Christian. But I don't know that personally. I don't know your personal relationship. <laughs> But we were once spiritually dead. But let me ask you this. Can you be saved and be spiritually dead? I think so. Can you actually have God in your heart and not really know the Holy Spirit? Yes. I've told the story about myself a little bit where I was saved as a young child. But I didn't have a full relationship it's different than being saved and having a relationship with Christ. And it, sometimes it takes a while to have that relationship. And really, to be honest with you, sometimes you have to learn how to have that relationship. And the proper teaching and the guidance comes along with that. If you go somewhere and you're taught and, you're, and your guidance is one way, you may not learn the full values of the Holy Spirit that are there for us. So Satan works... Or once we are saved, God expects us to walk in His Spirit with the Holy Spirit. And you know, I consider beauty and Holy Spirit the same tonight. That's what I'm, I'm calling it. The beauty is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is what people can see in us through our spiritual self, through the beauty that we give off. And you know, Satan works with the unbelievers and their works. And you know what? They show it, don't they? You can see that Satan when his believers, they show their works and you can see the unbelief in them. And you can see that in today's society that we're going, you know, sin is rampant right now. So you know what we're supposed to do? Step up and be even better. Amen. Have the Holy Spirit showing through us. We can't fight a battle against Satan by using Satan. We have to fully use the Holy Spirit. And you know, the works of a Christian should be seen in our lives. God's beauty should be seen in your actions, your lifestyle, and your talk. We can't expect people to be led to Christ when Christians are living like the devil and judging like a God. Now think about what I just said. How many Christians do you know do that? I've done that myself. It's hard not to judge some people sometimes. And sometimes it comes out before... You know, you ever heard it? It hits the tongue before it hits the brain? Well, you know, that kind of happens to me sometimes too. And it's hard. It's real hard. You have to really watch your actions. But I want you to really think about that. Can we lead people to Christ when Christians are living like the devil and judging like God? Neither one of those are our place. No. Neither one. And in Ephesians, we'll go to Ephesians 2. Chapter 2, verse 3. And it says, Among these unbelievers, we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, our behavior governed by the sinful self, indulging the desires of human nature without the Holy Spirit and the impulses of the sinful mind. I talked about those impulses, didn't I? We, have to, we should calculate our, our thought processes. And the impulses of the sinful mind. We were by nature children under the sentence of God's wrath, just like the rest of mankind. If you're a Christian tonight, we know where we going. We know our outcome. We know our fate. But we also know the fate of mankind that is of sinful nature, that is not of God. So what should we be doing? Should we be showing them Christ to bring them into the house of God? Unfortunately, every pew in here tonight, I know it's the fifth and it's after the fourth. And I'm not talking about any of our regular folks. We should have these pews, pews full with non-regular folks. And that's on each of us and on every one of us. And you know, the few nights, a few uh, weeks ago, I was talking to Pastor Keith, and I said, you know, it's discouraging. How many times have you asked people to come to church? 
over and over and over. Different ones, different ones. And you never see them. It gets discouraging, doesn't it? Then you wonder, like, why even bother? I mean, that's my thought process. Why bother? Because God says to you, we don't want to be judged for our for ourselves and for what we have done in Christ. So that's very important. Our fate, what we deserved, has been sealed that we will go to heaven now. Because we have been saved. But God's grace and His mercy is what will give us that. His mercy and His grace. So if we have that and He's given us that, should that not be evident in our life? Should we not see, should people not see that in our lives? And I know everybody in here, and I'm not being judgmental by any, because I'm just as guilty at times, but how many people have you ever seen, have you ever seen a hateful Christian that it just seems like they just hate life in general? Do you ever wonder where their heart really is? By the fruit you bear, is what we give off. Our presence, our everyday living is who we are. And if people see us as hateful and non-loving and judgmental, do they want to come here with us? Not at all. So now let's go to Colossians 4, 5, and 6. And it says, conduct yourselves with wisdom in your interactions with outsiders, that being non-believers. Make the most of each opportunity, treating it as something precious. Think of that. Every time you know you're with someone that's a non-believer, how do you treat that moment? How do you treat that very moment? He says, treat it as something precious. Precious. Because we only have, it might be the only time that we have to give that chance, that opportunity to show them Christ. And you know, when I get up here to preach and teach, it's always a concern of mine when I say one wrong word that would turn somebody away, that they would be lost forever. Because the people that are sitting here, most of the ones in here are regulars and they come all the time. But that time that that one comes that's not, how we act and give off our, ourselves is, means a lot, doesn't it? Because they know whether or not they want to come back and be part of the family of Christ. But in verse 6 it says, Let your speech at all times be gracious and pleasant, seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to answer each one questioned you. Now I have to admit, we went out to go, we got, went and got ice cream and this, when I, of course, when you go do something, I call it stupid and I did something stupid because then I read this verse and I'm thinking, back on me, you know, so I had to ask God to forgive me for it. But we went out to get ice cream and when I went to get ice cream and we all went through the line, I had a $20 bill and a $100 bill. Well, it's $27 and something. Ice cream's expensive at the beach. So I give the lady a $100 bill and she said, I can't take that. Well, I guess I'm a little old school. Cash is a whole lot better than anything else. And she looked at me and she said, can't take it. I said, why not? She said, hold on a minute. I guess it was the man. She said, we can't take hundreds, can we? She said, no, because maybe counterfeit. And I looked there and I said, well, I don't appreciate your assumptions that I'm giving you counterfeit money. Well, I shouldn't have said that. See, I just give off a vibe of a non... I shouldn't, you know, it wasn't that girl's fault. She didn't make the rules. But, you know, it's just one of those things where, you know, when you grow up and you're a certain way and you live a life of this is how we do things, of course, then I had to put $27 on my Discover card. Because I don't use debit cards out from, you know, non-normal places. So... It's just one of those, but it's just the little things like that. Did I show a Christian attitude to that girl? No. I come, come I was combated with her. In no sense. I mean, I wasn't harsh and I didn't raise my voice, but I, you know, shouldn't have done that, should have. Should have been nice. Because it wasn't her fault. So you know, we all have to give and learn on 
how we're supposed to talk to people. You know, everyone we meet and see are different. Everyone's beauty is also subjective. So, the way that they see me may be different than the way that you see me, and vice versa. Everybody's beauty is subjective. But if you're not a Christian, everyone should always see our beauty. The beauty that we give off. God's beauty. The Holy Spirit should be um, something that everyone sees all the time. You know, today, in today's world, we see a lot of ugly. You know, I'm talking about beauty tonight, but how much ugly is out there? We need to be different. People need to see us as different. The Bible says we're to be a stranger. Like it's a strange people. We're supposed to be strange. <coughs> embrace the Holy Spirit. Embrace God's beauty. Let that shine. Because if we're not shining the light and being the lighthouse, then they're never going to see Christ. And that's what we're here for. That's our duty and that's our job. So let's go to Luke 3 and 8. <clears throat> and it says, uh, Therefore, produce fruit that is worthy and of, uh, consistent with your repentance. I had this verse picked out before Ken talked about repentance this morning. And I think that's something else, you know, if it comes up twice in one day, it's got to be true, right? right. <laughs> so, uh, so repentance, that is life. That is... Live changed lives. Turn from sin and seek God as His righteousness. And do not even begin to say to yourselves as a defense, we have Abraham for our father. And so our heritage assures us of salvation. For I say to you, that from these stones, God is able to raise up children, His descendants. For Abraham, for God can replace the unrepented regardless of their heritage. And those who were obedient, who are obedient. It doesn't matter who you are or where you come from. The only place that you can get repentance from is God. Amen. There's nothing else that we can get repentance from, from anybody. There's nothing we can do. There's nothing we can say. And there's nowhere we can go to. And it doesn't matter if your father was a founder of the church. We want to help build the church. Or he was a preacher here for 40 years? It doesn't matter. You know, they even tried, evidently they tried saying Abraham was one of our descendants. It doesn't matter about your genealogy, who you are. We have to make sure that we are repenting to God for what we've done. Amen. That's how we show our beauty. See, when I talk mean to that girl, if I'd never figured out I'd done wrong, I'll do wrong again, won't I? And then I'll do wrong again, won't I? Over and over and over. So it's the repentance. We always have to go back over and over to make sure. And it's required by God's Word to bear the fruit of God. God's beauty, the Holy Spirit. You know, John the Baptist was warning here about that. We can't use our genealogy and who was behind us to take and to claim our ancestral connection to having our salvation. It's not going to happen. So we have to make sure. And also, one other point about the genealogy. No matter who you are, it's not going to change someone's attitude toward God. How you treat them how you show Christ to them is how you change their thoughts of God. There's a lot of people out there that don't believe in God. But the only way that we're going to get them to believe in God is to show them who God really is. To love them. You know, Pastor Keith talked about love on Wednesday night. I believe it was. I was, like I said, it was at the beach, but I watched it. You know, he preached about love. And it's amazing to me if I watch these, these messages this week come up. I had mine finished for the most part on Tuesday. And then all of a sudden, I see these other two and then 
Brother Ken and all how this works up to where we're at tonight. When we live our lives, we should show Christ. If you live your life as the Word requires, people will see the beauty in your heart. Let's go to Ephesians 2 and 4. Going back to Ephesians. But God being so very rich in mercy because of His great and wonderful love with which He loved us, He loved each and every one of us. And the mercy that He has given us. We should be... I'm just so amazed at how people can just sit back and take so much advantage of what Christ has given them. We should, the, the church houses should be full of the Christians that say they're Christians and the people that say they're saved and love God. Well, if you love God, why aren't you showing Him after the mercy that He has shown us? That's what I want to know tonight. Where are all these people that so-called love God and love Christ? Why are they not here? Have they not been given that love? Have they not shown, have been shown the love to where they can give their heart to Christ? Fully give their heart to Christ? I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm just saying maybe they need to reevaluate their lives a little bit. Verse 5 says, Even when we were spiritually dead and separated from Him because of our sins, He made us spiritually alive together with Christ for by His grace, another word that I love, grace, His undeserved favor and mercy, you have been saved from God's judgment. All of us, if you're a Christian, has been saved from God's judgment. When He sent His Son to die on the cross for our sins, that judgment of, for us, when we accepted Him, was taken away. The judgment of what was due us was to eternal damnation. But He took that away because we accepted Him for what He had done for us and loved Him. That's what I love tonight. I love His mercy. I love His grace. I appreciate that. It's wonderful. Absolutely wonderful. You should be a spiritually alive tonight. Everybody that has Christ in their heart should feel spiritually alive. You should be beautiful in the Holy Spirit. People should see that beauty. And unfortunately, if you've not accepted Him, we all know where we that, that we die and they go to hell. There's only two places to end up. People don't like to hear about hell anymore. But there's a heaven and there's a hell. Yes, sir. There's only two places that you can end up. One or the other. And I hope that someone out there, if they're in Facebook, you know, you can get saved wherever you are. You just have to ask Him. Let's go to Ephesians 2, 6. And I'm going to read 6 through 10. The finish shows up. So as I read... You can keep going, scrolling through the Scripture. And He raised up his, us up together with Him. When we believed and seated us with Him in the heavenly places because we are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah tonight. And He did this so that in the ages to come, He might clearly show the immeasurable, immeasurable and surpassed riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus by providing for our redemption. For it is by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ, that you have been saved, actually delivered from judgment and given eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, not through your own effort, but is the undeserved gracious, I love that, undeserved gracious, that's this verse, gift of God not as a result of your works nor your attempt to keep the law. You know, you go to the Old Testament, they tried to keep the law. And then when Jesus come along, they didn't know what to do. They were like, He's following a different law. It was God's law, wasn't it? They wasn't following. He wasn't following the Jewish law. But you know, they also tried to trick Him many, many times. But they never tricked Jesus. Verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship, 
His own masterwork, a work of art, created in Christ Jesus, reborn from above, spiritually transformed. I love that. Renewed, ready to be used. There's another one. How many people tonight, most everybody here, we see being used in the church? Most everybody here are workers that's here tonight. But how many people are not ready to be used in the church? For good works. You didn't get works. I want, you to, I want to point out something. You don't do good works to get saved. You do good works after you get saved. That's the difference. And what I like to point out is why are you not working in the church? You have on any given Sunday 150 people coming into the church. And I guess they magically think all this takes place. A lot of work goes into a Sunday morning and Sunday night service. A lot of behind the scenes things that people don't see, right? The children are here hours before practicing. People don't see it. What work is people giving off? What works are they giving? Which God prepared for us beforehand, taking paths which He set so that we would walk in them, living the good life which He prearranged and made ready for us. Hallelujah. You know, God had this figured out before we were ever born, before our ancestors was ever born, before Adam and Eve, He knew what was going to happen. He had this prearranged. He set it up. But man also has free will. We have free will to change things. He allowed us to have free will. God didn't want to make us love Him. He wanted us to love Him. Amen. That's the difference. So where are you tonight? Do you love Him because you're spiritually filled with the Holy Spirit? Or do you love Him because that's what you've always been taught and that's why you're at church? There's a difference. It took me many years to figure that out. So let's not live a lie. If you're saved, if you're a Christian, everyone knows it. And you know, there's probably some out there that's really good at putting on the front. And we may think they're saved. And they may pass on if we think they're saved. And then someday when they meet God, He may say, depart from me, I never knew you. I hope and I pray and I try daily that those words will never be said to me. I don't want those words said to me. You go into Matthew and He says, depart from me, I never knew you. Is that what we want to hear? Well, it's too late then. Too late. And it says, uh, so there was four points that I took out of Ephesians out of what I've got so far. And it says God made us to worship Him and love Him. But He also made it our choice. By God's grace, you can be saved. That was point two. Point three is that I had in my mind was that God had given me and says you can't do any works or be your genealogically connected to anyone to get saved. Point four of all of this was, but once you are saved, God expects good works from you. Those are the points that I really want to point out on those that we went through. So let me ask you if a Christian sounds like this. Does a Christian sound like you hardly come to church? You never working in the church? You never tied in the church? You don't give any time to the church? These are not attributes of a Christian, are they? These are attributes of a non-believer. So what does the world see when they see you? And I say you, I say we, me, us, the church, the body. You know, if you look on Facebook yesterday, it has a lot of people. A lot of different places. I won't name any names of where I saw people. But I didn't see them in church today. But they had all kinds of fun yesterday. Just asking the question, where is your heart? Where is that beauty of the Holy Spirit? We can't expect to get people into the church and win souls. 
when we're acting like the world. We must show love, kindness, and Spirit of God. Our actions are sometimes, our non-action can literally send people to hell. And that's on us it, as Christians. The world today will tell you to believe one way or a certain way. And if you don't, you get called all these names. I started to name them off, but then I thought, oh, better not. Some of the things that we get called as Christians because we're not accepting to certain lifestyles. These are just gimmicks. This is just distractions of Satan. This is just the Jezebel spirit rolling out through our land telling us that we're wrong. The world's telling us we're wrong. But we need to stand strong. We need to stand for Christ. We need to stand and show that beauty that He has given us. Then if you go to John 14, 1 and 2, says, do not let your heart be troubled. This is for us as Christians. We have something. Believe confidently in God and trust in Him. Have faith. Hold on to it. Rely on it. Keep going and believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. Because I am going there to prepare a place for you. Hallelujah tonight. He is telling us. You know, Jesus, if you read this, what is he talking? Who is he talking? He's talking to the disciples. And he's trying to tell them, you know what, it's going to be okay. I don't believe God put these verses in here just for the disciples. These verses are in here for believers, Christians. For those that love Him and give their heart to Him. Hold on to your faith. Can people see your faith? Can people see your confidence? What makes you confident? Studying. Knowing, right? You've got to be knowledgeable to be confident in what you're doing. I know Brother Ken, he's done electrical works heat and air work all through the years. You had to be pretty confident to get into that stuff and you got hurt, didn't you? Well, you know, as Christians, we can get hurt if we're not confident in what we're doing. Jesus is preparing a place for you. Let's go to Ecclesiastes. Now we're back to the beginning, back to the end. I tried to go relatively quick. But it says, For the person who pleases Him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner He gives the work of gathering and collecting, so that He may give to one who pleases God. This too is a vanity of chasing after the wind. True happiness and joy is only given, and truly only given by God. The beauty in your heart and in your soul, the Holy Spirit that you put out can only be truly given by God. Nowhere else. And you know, I think tonight I was... I don't know that we need to do a for say an altar call tonight, Peggy. It just, I don't know why, but I'm getting a different feeling. But I think what I would like to do is to come up if you will, and the praise team will come up. We're going to sing together. And we're going to, we're going to fill this building with the Holy Spirit from us that we have. We're going to show the love that we have for Christ. And we're going to throw, we're going to build him up tonight. You know, I have some other notes in here that I don't think are necessary. But if there is someone here tonight <clears throat> that is maybe like I did said the wrong word, done the wrong thing. Ask God for repentance. Take your repentance to Him. Take care of that. Because you know, 
it's easier to get it off your chest than it is to carry it around. By a long shot, it is. And you know, I'd really like to say tonight that I appreciate the opportunity to get up. Um, I think that maybe this message was meant for somebody. I don't know who it was. It may not even be anybody in this building. It may be somebody out there on Facebook somewhere or YouTube or somewhere else. I don't know. But it meant a lot to me to go through this too. You know, I've often said that when you're going, and I think Pastor Keith even said it, when you're going a message, it actually takes care of you before you're able to give it to anybody else. Because it's you have to do a lot of praying and checking up to get to, to get to the point where you can give it. But you know what? I appreciate the opportunity now. I appreciate the opportunity that he gave me. I appreciate the opportunities that the church has given me. But let's tonight, let's just stand up and just praise God. That's what we need to do. In everything that we do, let's just praise God. Let's love God. And if somebody needs to come off, you're more welcome. But let's just praise God tonight. Hallelujah.
people that's out traveling. We do have a lot of people on vacation, so let's remember them. We've got a lot going on vacation. Let's keep them in our thoughts and prayers and traveling because, you know, it is a little bit nuts out there on the road sometimes. So let's remember all them. Um, also, if you have any ties, don't forget to give those on your way out. Is so, there any announcements that anybody may have? Anybody have anything on their heart they want to say? Nothing. A lot of clothes. Our dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, Lord, for just another wonderful day in your house. We thank you for the services that you've given us. We thank you for just your spirit. We thank you for the blessings. We thank you for the mercy. We thank you for the grace. We just ask you, God, if you will, to please go with each one here. Keep our hearts, God, where people can see the beauty in our lives, the beauty of you, because the lives that we live is what transforms what people can see and what they have for you to make them whole again. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. And go with each person here tonight. Go with those that were not, unable to come, that wanted to be here, God, and we bless them. We'll pray for them to be able to return. And those that weren't, God, we thank you for them. Go with each person here and all these things we ask in Jesus' name.